Well, um, good evening. And uh, it is, as they say, and I can't see anybody, but it's great to be here, and I'm sure you are here. Um, <laughs> I've got, um, I haven't got very long, and I've got a message, I suppose, it, and everybody has to have a message, and I've got one. Um, as I was introduced, I, I'm, I live a lot of my life with aviation. Uh, I'm a physicist by training, and I think aviation is just wonderful. And, I, and the story I want to tell tonight is about aviation. And, and what I want to tell you is, is not only I think it represents a real pinnacle of sort of human achievement in terms of technology and engineering and all that sort of good stuff, but also it, it's like a, I don't know whether the words are some metaphor, but it, I think it shows just how amazing human beings can be in terms of when they cooperate together for a sort of common, a sense of common purpose. Because in aviation, it, it really is, I mean, over the last hundred, aviation has allowed us to travel at speeds which we could never dream of a hundred years ago and ac access uh, areas and places that would just be impossible without it. And, and it's a truly global enterprise. So you have people flying airplanes sort of all over the place. And, and, and we sort of, we just take it for granted. But I spend a lot of my life, um, and I've just come back from a group of, uh, of, of, of sort of subject matter experts, if you like, where we're sort of involved in, in worrying about uh, fuel quality. And when you look at aviation, aviation is just, you know, when you go on holiday and, and you, you fly uh, on your, on, uh, uh, to Spain or, or, or Dubai or wherever, you know, however wealthy you are and all that sort of stuff. Um, but on, on those airplanes, you're, the safety, you're very confident that nothing's going to go wrong. Um, and, and, and it doesn't because there's some very strong principles of aviation safety. And not one of them is um, that things should either fail safe, you know, if, if they go wrong, it doesn't matter. Or if they could go, if, if it would matter, then you have to have more than one of them. Typically two, or sometimes three. So you have, you know, two engines, two autopilots, two navigation systems, have two pilots. Um, typically you have two sorts of red wine as well, and, and things like that. So, you know, you, they take safety seriously. Um, it looks like two wings, although, in fact, it wouldn't work with only one. But, um, but you have all two, two things. And, but interestingly, there's only one fuel. Only one fuel. So if something goes wrong with the fuel, you're absolutely stuffed. <laughs> um, so, there is, so people take fuel fantastically seriously. I, I mean, that's why I spend my life taking it seriously. And, and so... And one of the things that amazes me about all this is that you've got all around the world, um, you've got people doing things um, pretty well the same way. And it's just astonishing. You know, you've got, you know, down the road at Heathrow, that where that they, they pump 25 million litres of fuel goes into Heathrow and goes, flies out of it every day. 25 million litres. And that's, you know, it's a thousand road tankers driving in and out. Um, and all that, the people doing that are very similar to someone in you know, up-country Africa with one little tank and a, and a little pump um, fueling aircraft. And, and I think that, that, that sort of stand, that, that standardization and that similarity, different languages, different people, all doing the same thing. Um, but we, and, and in a way, I, I, I want to... I've said sort of words like... I, I want us to imagine that we're... At Heathrow, and, and just we, we're going to set off. We're going to, this is a 380 Qantas flight that's going to go, and and we're going to you, you can see those words. We're going to fly something like six and a half thousand miles, and, and you know you can read the numbers, and, and it's a very heavy. It, you know it's got 200 tons of fuel on it. There's 60 tons of passengers. You know, airlines like to call them self-loading cargo, but uh, <laughs> but we're passengers. Um, and so, you know, and, and we're all going to go off, and and and, it, and I think it's just remarkable. And we're going to have thirteen hours, and we're going to watch movies and all sorts of things. And and at the same time, there's all sorts of things happening. Um, you know, there's there's in the engines, there's turbine blades, and they exist at temperatures above their melting point. You know, they're, they're and and there's fuel at, at temperatures down to minus forty centigrade. The air temperature is minus seventy. Right. With the navigation systems are timing radio pulses to a billionth of a second, so it knows where it is all the time. And you know, you've got lots of meals, and 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 then, and then there's the the, the, the whole thing's held up by 
two wings, of course, and the pressure differential across the wing, we'll talk a bit about lift, but it is about one PSI. You know? It, you know, and you know, then you pump your tire up, it's sort of 80 or 90 PSI. It's just one PSI. Now, there's an urban myth that says that pressure differential is equivalent to a baby sucking milk. Now, some people in the room that could probably validate that. I can't. But anyway, it's a sort of urban myth that says that a baby, that's about the suck of a baby. Anyway, but the whole thing, is, is, I think, is remarkable. And, and, and you know, we haven't, you know, it haven't got here by accident. I mean, I think it, we're, we're sort of, you know, there's a history, you know. And, that all, and I, I'm just going to go through a bit of history because one of the things I've noticed is I get, when I was young, <laughs> I was, um, I, at school, particularly at school, I hated history. You know, lots of people do. But as you get older... It's funny, I don't know, you just seem to get more interested in history. And, and I always think it, it's probably because you have more history than future, really. But the, the, so, anyway, I've got more interest in history. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of a, a snapshot of, of how we've got where we've got, okay, with, with aviation. Because I think it's something we should really be, uh, as human beings, be really proud of. And, and, and so, you know, when years ago, you know, people were looking at birds flying and, and thought this was terrific and, and all, people have always wanted to you know, emulate the birds and that and, 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 and the, the thing was that, that and people did um, but this chap a um, guy called George Cayley we can't go into lots of detail I'd love to talk for hours about this but George Cayley was an interesting guy lived in the, in the mid 1700s he was born mid 1700s he was a baronet and the clever thing about George was he did all sorts of things. Very I mean, clever Victorian engineer and that. Invented spoked wheels, for example. Spoke wheels. Yeah. And that, trans that completely transformed wheel technology. Because all of a sudden, the, the, the bottom of the wheel didn't have to take the whole weight of the, uh, of, of the cart. It was strung, effectively hung over the top of the room. Anyway, that's by the by. But um, he was a clever chap. And what he did was he realized that you didn't have to flap wings to fly. Okay? And that was really important. So he separated out the, uh, the forces. So instead of this sort of stuff where um, uh, um, that is, is meant to be flapping but it's not anyway. Um, <laughs> but what he, um, what he did, he, he, he was able to, um, to say look we're going to separate out lift and weight, balance each other out and then thrust and drag. So he said, as long as we move a wing, uh, a wing, a lifting surface through the air, that's enough. So all we've got to do is move it. Right? And then it creates lift, and that will support the weight. So and that, that, was, that was really a big moment uh, for him. Well, for everybody, really. But he, uh, he sorted it. And that was really important because that gives us a, um, a, a really a, a great look at what was uh, a, an ability to sort of analyze it all and, and the rest of it. So you've got those four forces, and we're just going to look at a couple of those, because it's important. So uh, you've got lift balances the weight, and the thrust. Um, and lift is a bit magical. We can't got time to go into all the details of lift, but it is, I think, pretty magical. You move something through, and you get a force at right angles to the movement. That's pretty neat. And, um, and, and as you do it, you've got this thing, um, you get drag. Now, drag's a, 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 a bit of a problem, because that's you're going to have to overcome this drag to move the wing through the air. And, and drag comes in a, in a couple of different forms. And you get the own ordinary sort of drag you get when you drive your car through an, an air resistance sort of drag. And, and we all know about that if you cycle too fast and, and, and there's a wind and all that sort of stuff. But there's another sort of drag, which is, is, is the sort of lift-induced drag. And, and one of the things about that, that's really quite interesting because it's, you get more of this at slow speeds. So you, when you get this sort of effect of, of one thing going down and the other thing going up, you can see from there, there's a point where you've got the minimum drag. And minimum drag's an interesting thing, because when you're going off flying on holiday, particularly if you fly a long way, an airplane always wants to fly at its minimum drag speed, because that burns less fuel and it, all the rest of it. And, and they're designed to fly that. Lots and lots of clever bits of design. And... So when you, you're flying at the speed, as the plane uses up the fuel, we've got these 200 tonnes of fuel on the plane, 
Okay? It's going along, and it's getting lighter, because we're chucking out all the bloody carbon dioxide out the back. Um, but it, it, it's getting lighter, and so it doesn't need so much lift. Okay? So it could slow down, but it doesn't want to slow down because it's designed to fly at a particular speed, and you want to stay at that speed. So what happens is it, it just let, lets itself climb. So when you're flying, next time you're flying and you start off, you'll start off at 32,000 feet or so. By the time you get there, you might be at 39,000 feet because it just, the aircraft just, it's called a cruise climb, it just wanders up. And that's because it's always trying to be as efficient as it can be. Anyway, that's that. How are we doing? Good. Right. So those are the forces. Here's the saying. Lift is a gift but thrust is a must, okay? Because we have to overcome all that nasty drag. And it's the thrust that does it. And here's the bit where the chemistry comes in, because how do we get thrust? Well, we get thrust by chucking air out the back, and Newton says if you chuck enough air out the back, your aircraft will go forward, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. And you can do that in a number of ways. But the fundamental thing is you need an engine. And engines, you know, uh, revolutionized our lives in mid-1700s. It started the Industrial Revolution. And it's a way of converting heat engines, convert chemical energy into sort of mechanical energy, things we can do, right? For, so from the mid-1700s, all of a sudden, it wasn't just us that had to do stuff, or horses, you know. We had machines. We had things that would do things on our behalf, okay? And it wasn't just people. So we have, and you can see here, there's a couple of different, um, there's a jet engine and there's a, a piston engine. And, and depending on the, um, on the type, the early engines were all piston engines, a bit like you have in your car, and that was all the early, uh, all the early stuff. But one of the problems with a piston engine and a propeller is that there's a limit to how fast you can go. Because, you know, you generate the, the, the thrust with the rotating propeller, but as the aircraft goes fast, the, the propeller actually goes through a spiral. So it doesn't just go round. It goes, and, and that spiral, the, the, the forward speed adds to the rotational speed. And very quickly, the tip is going faster than the speed of sound. And that makes a hell of a noise. And it also uses a lot of fuel up because it produces an amazing amount of drag. So very quickly, around the Second World War, people said, we can't go fast enough in propeller-driven aircraft. We'll have to use jets. And then and everything else um, is, is, is about jets. So thrust is a must. But also, you know, everything about fuel aircraft is about weight, okay? So weight is everything. You know, you have uh, lightweight uh, uh, bits and pieces on aircraft. You have special, uh, you know, like aluminium this and all sorts of stuff. So it's all about, all, all about weight. And, um, and, and I've always wondered why tickets aren't based on weight, but there we are. Um, at, um, it, it, they are. We're an average size of 100 kilograms with our luggage. That's, uh, that's how we're... Calculate. Um, so, but power to weight ratio is really important. And, um, and this is a just runway is necessary to give a takeoff for this man operated machine of the air. And defying death, the intrepid inventor himself sits at the controls and hurls himself into the sky. Right. Okay. Man's attempts to copy the birds have traditionally failed. Right. Because his body has not such an efficient weight-to-power ratio. Indeed, indeed. So when we look at, um, at power, ooh, yep. when we look at power-to-weight ratios, then, well, uh, we haven't really got time to go through them, but it's critical in, in, in aviation to, um, and, and you can see, this is the one really to watch, because this chap down here, the right flyer, um, when, when the Wright brothers did a couple of things, they, the, the reason they got flying was a, all sorts of things. They knew about lift and they studied aerodynamics. It's very clever. But they also had a mechanic. They, had, they were bike mechanics. They had a, a bike mechanic in their shop called Charlie Taylor, who they, they went out to the automobile in, industry at the time. They said, we want a really lightweight engine with lots of power. What can you do for us? And, and the automotive engine people said, well, this is the best we can do. So instead, they said, well, that's no good. It hasn't got the right power-to-weight ratio for us. So Charlie, you're our mechanic, make us an engine. And, and effectively, in six weeks, Charlie made the lightest, most powerful engine known to, in the world at that time. On his own. 
well, a few drawings and bits and pieces. Remarkable achievement. Absolutely remarkable. And that's really the other thing that uh, that's the engine he built. And uh, it gave out 12 horsepower, weighed 90 kilograms. Um, so not very good by our standards. But anyway, this is, it, flying is not just about thru lift and thrust. In fact, it's about control. And that's one of the things that the Wright brothers, um, the Wright brothers did. And here, here, here's the, the, the Wright brothers getting going. And the other little thing you can see, you just watch that little weight come down. Well, that little weight was one of the ways they got over that high induced drag thing that, at low speed. Anyway, we can't dwell on that. So it's all about um, thrust and going faster. And here we are. This is a Trent 900 engine. And this is one of the engines we've got on our A380. And, and just the thing I want to point out is when you look at this huge engine, really powerful, huge amount of thrust, it would suck the air out of this room to create thrust in about a second. So it moves this sort of size of plays out in about a second to create sort of thrust. And, but most of the air is, is driven by this fan. Okay? So the actual core of the engine, not that much, not much air goes down. 80% of the thrust comes from the front of, of the fan, which is, means, and that's one of the things which made aviation really grow, because that makes engines very efficient, but also makes them very quiet. So in a sense of the frequency of flying around airports, although people live in airports think it's noisy, if, if, you, if we didn't have these big turbofans, it would be fantastically noisy. So that is really revolutionized in terms of saving fuel and, uh, and, and, um, and, and, and reducing noise. So it's about fuel. I've, I've just mentioned that. So it's more than, I mean, there's lots of passion in aviation, lots of imagination. And, but what is jet fuel? Well, jet fuel, you know, it is wonderful stuff. It's got this huge energy density that hydrocarbons have. It's, it, it flows at cold temperatures, so you know, it's stored in the wing. There's no special. The wing is just a hollow fuel tank, really. And uh, it burns. It's also not taxed, of course. That makes it nice and cheap to, to go on holiday. Um, and, and where does it come from? Well, it sort of it sits between gasoline, you know, petrol and diesel. So it sits there. You get about 10% of, of a barrel of crude oil is, is jet fuel. And, uh, you know, wonderful stuff. And, and you know, I, I just, I mean, I, I spend my life with it. And, and you know, here, here we got this uh, Qantas uh, 380. It's got 200 tons of the stuff on it, and, and, and it's heading off. So this is getting to the end here. Um, so, you know, deal with the emotion if you can. Um, <laughs> But what I really want to say is, you know, I think, you know, we've got this, this fuel. We, it, it, there's, there's the chemistry of the fuel, the, the fact that you know, there's the technology and, and all the rest of, 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 of that with the fuel. And then there's the, um, the, the, the fact that we've got to look after it. We've got the quality right. We don't want it to fail because there's single point failure and all that sort of stuff. And that, so in the end, we say if lift is a gift, thrust is a must. If you hear, remember nothing else, remember that. But also, fuel is a jewel, <laughs> and we must treasure it. Thank you.